Surfers, hello. Uh, coastal management video today. So, what are we going to do? Well, I want to introduce you to a range of hard engineering and softer management approaches, and I'm going to give you an outline uh, or a description of each one. It might be better if you do this uh, as a spider diagram. So, in the centre of your page, hard engineering is a kind of title, and then uh, your legs spinning off for each each strategy. Just a bit of a description of each one and what it does. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for soft soft management approaches. As part of that, obviously, we're going to learn the difference between or the definition of what hard and soft management is. We're going to then briefly uh, look at some of the hard engineering hard engineering approaches along the Holderness coast and one of our soft uh, soft management strategies which is managed retreat uh, has taken place on the Humber estuary which is kind of an extension to the Holderness coast and uh, there's also the Blackwater uh, Blackwater estuary in the southeast of the UK which we're going to have a quick little nosy at. Uh, we're going to kick off though by looking at two tools that planners and coastal managers can use that help them make decisions as to what strategies they use along any stretch of coastline. If we just have a look at the spec for a minute, what have we got, what we're going to get through? Uh, 2B.11, there are different approaches to managing the risks associated with coastal erosion and flooding. So we're going to cover this when my pen decides to work. This and this today. You could also argue that some of, some of, uh, some of these techniques or approaches also fit or can be used as part of a sustainable approach. Uh, but we're going to do cover that specifically in the next video. Right, then give it a title. Hard and soft management. Or hard and soft approaches. Uh, and I'm going to kick off with definitions. So write these please. Hard engineering involves building structures to try and stop or alter natural processes. It's often intrusive and its aim is to stop or prevent flooding and erosion. So it's working against national national it's working against natural processes like longshore drift, like mass movements, uh, erosion. Yep. Soft engineering or soft approaches aim to work with natural processes to help protect coasts. So there's still an element of uh, maybe reducing flooding or erosion, but it's, it's coming from a different angle. We're trying to work with natural processes rather than work against them. That is the key definition or the key difference. Keywords then, you've, you've covered the first two. Uh, the two tools that we're going to look at, one is called a cost-benefit analysis or CBA. That does not stand for, can't be asked, uh, but you'll never forget it now. CBA, cost benefit analysis. The other one is an environmental impact assessment. Uh, other key terms, we might have touched on these already. Terminal groin syndrome, outflanking, sediment starvation. Right then, the first tools. What tools can coastal managers use? Well, the first one is a cost benefit analysis and I like to think of this as kind of seesaw. Uh, coastal managers might be in charge of protecting uh, a full stretch of coastline. They're going to have a limited budget. Uh, they've not got an endless pot of money uh, to, to spend you know protecting the whole coastline so they've got to make decisions uh, and there's lots of careers in, for geographers uh, in this kind of this kind of coastal management. So, what is a cost benefit analysis? It is a tool, all right? All right in big letters. It's a tool that coastal managers can use and it's going to help them decide whether a project or strategy is worth carrying out or not. All right? What does it 
how does it work? Well, on the one side of the seesaw, you've got to weigh up the costs. How much does a seawall and rock armour, for instance, cost to design, to build and maintain? So it's thinking in terms of the short term, i.e. we're going to have to spend X number of pounds to, to build this seawall, but how much is it going to cost over the long term? So, yeah, what, what we're going to have to spend. And on the other side are the benefits we're going to get from that. So it could be uh, the value of the land that's been saved, the housing that's been protected, the savings that we've not had to spend uh, in relocating people, uh, the benefits to local businesses and their profits. Uh, and some of these benefits are tangible. We can actually measure them really easily. Other uh, benefits might be intangible. They're difficult to measure, but, but we know they're kind of there. Yep. For instance, intangible benefits would be uh, the positive multiplier effect in the local economy from uh, keeping the tourist industry booming, for instance. That's pretty difficult to measure that. All right. So if the benefits of the project outweigh the costs, that's a pretty decent sign that, yeah, this is a good idea. All right. If the cost outweighs the benefits, then it's less likely to be uh, economically kind of viable yep, as a project. Okie pokey. The second tool that we can use is, well, we've got to consider the environmental impact of any management as well. So an EIA, or an environmental impact assessment, considers the impact of, of the development or management on the environment, the ecology, the wildlife, uh, yeah, versus the project's benefits, maybe economically and socially. So it's no good kind of thinking of a weird and wonderful management strategy what, uh, you know, has lots of economic benefits but is a complete disaster for the environment and the wildlife. So we've got to kind of weigh up a couple of different factors. Right then, start your spider diagram in the centre of your page. Uh just put hard engineering strategies okay then and I'm gonna basically show you some pictures introduce uh, each strategy all I want you to do is give a little description of what it is and what it does we will look at the advantages and disadvantages of each one in lesson but I'm not gonna do that now because my video would be about eight eight hours long right so the first one then sea walls uh, so sea walls if you've been to the seaside you've been to skeggy i'm sure you've seen something like this uh, they can be either bull-nosed or curved all right or they can be stepped uh, and when we go on the field trip you will see an example of a stepped sea wall but some of them are curved what do they what do they do well you find them at the cliff foot obviously uh, and their job is to reflect or dissipate and absorb wave energy all right they tend to be uh, concrete and they've got deep foundations uh, so if destructive waves are breaking at the cliff foot they can't kind of get get scoured as easy all right and undercut uh, bullnose or recurved seawalls kind of reflect wave energy back on itself so if a wave's breaking here just by the shape it'll run up and it'll uh, be sent back to where it came from yep they are the most expensive strategy out of the lot it varies but well, this is quite vague but between 3,000 and 10,000 nicker a square meter yep or per meter so if we are thinking in terms of impact as, uh, as cost benefit analysis these are very expensive yep we can't just have miles and miles of sea walls for a whole stretch of coastline within a literal cell because we're not going to be able to afford it 
Okie Koki. Next one is a revetment. Now a revetment is a sloping wooden or concrete structure placed either at the foot of the cliff or on the back shore. All right. Uh, sloping because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's a sloping kind of uh, structure. Their aim, again, is to absorb wave energy, but they are permeable. So if you see, you've got little gaps in between these wooden kind of slats, if you like. Uh, so that allows w water to kind of percolate into the beach. Uh, yep, yeah, again, main aim is to absorb wave energy, but allows for percolation. Cost, again, between £500 and £3,000 a square metre. Okie dokie. Next one is groins. What are they then? Well, they are stone or timber fences that run at 90 degrees or perpendicular to the to the kind of coastline. Uh, they tend to be spaced along the beach. Uh, how often they're spaced is is a matter for engineers and coastal management. But you know, on average, between 50 and 100 meters, you'll tend tend to find uh, these these are spaced. What do they do? They trap sediment from longshore drift and build up uh, a higher and a wider beach. All right create a high and wide beach which then can act as a buffer uh, and uh, uh, and as physical protection against breaking waves. What do they cost? Between £150 to £2,500 a square metre. Next hard engineering strategy is an offshore breakwater so what is this well just like the the name says granite rock boulders that are placed offshore uh, or in the near shore in shallower waters uh, and they force waves to break further out to sea all right so they force waves to break in shallow near shore waters their aim is to absorb wave energy and dissipate wave energy before they can damage uh, the back shore. You tend to place these parallel to the shore. All right. And if you look at this example just here, something's happened after these have been placed. So these are the rocks, the granite boulders, or offshore breakwaters, uh, and it does interfere with natural processes because you get wave refraction and deposition behind. Right then, cost of offshore breakwaters between 1750 and £4,300 a metre. Right. The last one is rip wrap, often referred to as rock armour. So, what is it? It's where large angular boulders are placed on the back shore. Now, using a bit of common sense and logic tells you that these large angular boulders are going to be made of very, very resistant lithology. So we're talking granite. Uh, granite's the most, most likely one. So they don't erode. Uh, they're placed on the back shore and they aim to break up and dissipate wave energy and prevent cliffs being undercut. They are often used in conjunction or as well as a seawall like in this example here. All right. So that is your five hard engineering strategies or techniques. Right. If we just introduce uh, Holden S management 
I'm going to mention a few things here. We're going to we're going to cover more of this in class. But if you think of this stretch of coastline from Flamborough Head in the north to Spurn Head in the south, the vast majority of this coastline is actually unprotected. All right. Uh, and if we think why that might be, well, it links back to uh, one of us tools, which is a cost benefit analysis, because it's roughly 90 kilometers long, this coastline. And I think approximately 83 kilometers is defended or protected. No, sorry. 83 kilometers unprotected with kind of no management strategy. And that's because a lot of this land is actually ag actually agricultural land and it's low value. So it doesn't make sense, if we have a look at this, it doesn't make sense spending you know, protecting the whole coastline with a seawall at £10,000 a square metre because it's going to cost an absolute fortune, it's unaffordable and the land that we're protecting, the farmland, is not worth that much. It's low land value. Now the farmers will probably disagree with that, whose land it is that, that's been lost, but, you know, we've, we've got a responsibility to the taxpayer as well uh, to get good value for these projects. Now, if we look at a couple of examples of places that are protected with groins, Bridlington's one, uh, Hornsey is another, Mapleton is another. So these are three towns that are protected with groins, and if we will take Hornsey, for instance, if we draw a line across to this graph we can see that at Hornsey the average annual erosion rate is zero yep no erosion we've got a seawall and we've got groins at Mapleton draw a line across same thing look no erosion because of seawall and groins and also at Withensey yep no erosion uh, average annual erosion rate zero but look what happens just after or just downdrift uh, and south of these towns you get a spike show a red pen here we go you get a sudden large increase in erosion rates all right and that's because again uh, these hard engineering strategies are kind of working against physical processes but that's got knock-on effects so what's happening well you know, student banging on the door folks I do apologize uh, sorry not sorry right so terminal groin syndrome uh, where you've got major groin fields like at Hornsey and Mapleton the the groins trap sediment and build up a beach all right but downdrift is obviously starved of sediment uh, and what you find is erosion rates increase and these kind of these keywords kind of work together when you're kind of explaining so because of terminal groin syndrome we get sediment starvation which means there's a lack of physical protection from a nice wide and high beach so erosion rates increase just after where the groins stop and this is called outflanking and I'm going to show you a couple of graphics that demonstrate this right this is Mapleton so if we just mark on the direction along shore drift which is from north to south in this way this direction the rock groin here has trapped sediment and created a nice wide and high beach you've also got rock armor uh, on the back shore as well but because of sediment starvation down drift then we get a, a narrower and lower beach which can't absorb the wave energy 
and act as physical protection. Therefore, the rates of erosion and coastal retreat just after the groin is a lot higher. All right, and you can see just by looking at the shape of the coastline. Uh, yeah, you can see, can't you, how much it's retreated. You can actually use satellite imagery to, to measure that as well, measure that distance. All right. Okay. Now, another photograph. I like my pictures. Brings geography to life, doesn't it? Yep, so what we got? Same place. Rock groin. Longshore drifts coming from north to south. What do you get? Much wider, higher beach. Uh, that traps where the groin traps sediment. However, immediately after the groin has has ended, the, that's the terminal groin or the last groin. What happens? We've got coastal retreat. Now, when erosion happens kind of behind or to the side of the the last groin that's called outflanking so eventually it'll curve around the back uh, and erode that right another little graphic now when planners are considering what type of management to use uh, they've also got to consider the future yeah future uncertainties so rising sea levels uh, f increased frequency of storms and they need to run some models and kind of predictions so if we take Hornsey for instance and, and Mappleton uh, where the red line is we've got a kind of hold the line hard engineering approach with sea walls and groins they trap sediment and create a white beach you can see the predictions for how quickly the coast will erode and how quickly we get outflanking. So the blue line is by 2025, the shape of the coastline is predicted to look like that. Green line 2055, coastal retreat and the new coastline will look like that. 2105, again, you know, we've we've got some severe outflanking just happening happening here, haven't we? So yep. Same at Mappleton as well. Yep. Right then. Nice shiny new page. Uh next spider diagram. Center of your page, give it a give it a heading of soft engineering approaches. Right then soft engineering or soft management the first one is beach nourishment so uh, groins trap sediment and create a nice wider and higher beach uh, if we've got longshore drift if maybe we've, we're on a swash aligned coast where the wave fronts are approaching kind of head on to the beach we're not going to have that uh, transportation of sediment along a coastline are we so if the wave fronts are approaching more or less head on and the destructive and the beach keeps eroding then we can't use groins because there's no lateral shift of sediment so we might have to do it artificially and actually nourish the beach so what is it it's where we replace beach sediments that have been eroded or potentially lost to longshore drift uh, a larger beach will absorb wave energy and protect the back shore from erosion so you can see before beach nourishment in this example we've got a narrower beach than in this example yep a little natural buffer and physical protection to absorb wave energy the next one is sand dune stabilization so the end of key area one coasts uh, we looked at the role of vegetation in stabilizing uh, coastal plains uh, and sandy coastlines and depositional landforms that are very vulnerable to erosion and flooding uh, 
if sand dunes get eroded and we get what's called a blowout like it looks like's happened in this photograph so a storm surge or a high tide has caused a blowout then what we can do is we can actually revegetate and replant uh, marram grass for instance we can also use uh, fencing as well uh, <coughs> to reduce trampling from people and I'll show you an example of that we can create pathways and fencing so trying to get people to actually to access the beach uh, using paths rather than trampling the vegetation uh, this is called a wooden boardwalk uh, and there's a there's a song I want a little bit of singing here under the boardwalk no I'm not really uh, yeah so that is a wooden boardwalk uh, that we can use in high traffic areas to stop trampling uh, yep we can also replenish sand in eroded areas and replant marram grass oops Woo. another photograph so you can see here, look, this area has been replanted. It looks like the sand has also uh, sand has also been replenished as well, and it's fenced. Yep. The next one is manage retreat, uh, and this is where we allow certain areas or parts of the coast to flood or erode uh, so we set aside areas for the sea to flood or erode often this is because of rising sea levels yep we're kind of admitting defeat and and kind of just saying well you know we can't keep adapting uh, to rising sea levels forever uh, we've got to kind of let let some some of us coastline flood uh, the areas of coast what are perfect for this former salt marshes uh, estuarine environments in estuaries uh, and low value land such as farmland all right it creates a buffer zone as well and it might ease uh, pressure in other areas and there's two case studies we're going to look at this the first one yeah, another photograph here look so we've had farmland and we've basically created a little kind of inlet and we're letting the sea flood flood this farmland and create a buffer zone yep manage retreat uh, the case studies then one is called just put a little example. Alkbra. Oops. In fact. It's on the Humber estuary. And it's called. Oh my god, come on, Kevin, sort it out. Alkbra Flats on the Humber estuary. We're going to have a look at that in lesson. Uh, in a lesson or two and look at the strengths and weaknesses of that and the other one is on the black it's Abbott's farm on the black water estuary I think that's a tributary oh, I can't even spell the tributary of the River Thames so southeast yep oops uh, this is a photograph of uh, Alkbra Flats we've got farmland and this area was kind of set set aside uh, to flood abbott's farm again was farmland and presumably you can see here where they've kind of created or, or got rid of the defenses and, and created these inlets so the river uh, at high tide can can kind of flood this farmland yeah so I'm presuming kind of this area has been set aside to flood 
Yep. The last one, the trickiest one, I've left it till last deliberately, is not beach nourishment. I forgot to change my head in. Here we go. It is cliff regrading and cliff drainage. So, uh, what is it? Well, if we've got softer, unconsolidated lithology, which is prone to mass movements such as rotational slumping, uh, then it's kind of uncertain when that's going to happen. Yeah, uh, it, it provides uncertainty for people or businesses that live near the cliff top. So, what do we do? Well, engineers calculate a stable slope angle, all right, based on the lithology. And then we try and artificially create that slope angle. So there's less chance of mass movements. Uh, the cliff slope is then artificially cut back to a stable angle. And if you have a look at this graphic, you will be getting given this in lesson, so you don't need to, to draw it. Uh, how can we kind of change the slope angle or the gradient of the cliff? Well, we can plant vegetation, all right, and we can uh, use a bit of a geotextile membrane to keep the soil in place. It does look fairly natural. Uh, yeah, we can regrade. Regrading cuts the cliff slope back to a more stable angle. We could also have possibly combine it with a hard engineering strategy, such as rock armor and revetment at uh, the cliff foot. Uh, we could use rock bolts and anchor the armor to the rock at the cliff foot. Again, this is a kind of hard engineering part of the strategy. Uh, we could also drain the cliff of uh, groundwater as well, reducing pore water pressure. So if you think of why we get uh, rotational slumping, for instance, one factor is the lithology being really soft and unconsolidated. Combined with that, we've got uh, gravity and the amount of saturation or moisture in, in that uh, unconsolidated lithology. So if we can drain the cliffs, then uh, they're going to have less water in them, they're less likely to slump. And I've just... Uh, I've just found a quick little photograph. I've just been on Google and typed in uh, cliff drainage. You can see you can install kind of uh, pipes what are designed to, to drain the water out of uh, unconsolidated boulder clay, for instance, and onto the beach. All right. If you need to watch it back, do it. Take your time. Have any questions ready for next lesson? Uh, okie pokey. Have a good one. Cheers.